record. All right. So the recording should be, have begun. And there it is. So I'm going to introduce our speakers. We have with us today what I like to call our A team. Um, we have Tom Shorb of Stock and Leader. We have Sherry Leo of Fulton Bank. And we have Tim Sutherland of Harvest Rock Advisors. Working with Tom, Sherry, and Tim to develop this content for you since last January. And I am so grateful to have their expertise here. So I'll turn it over to all of you. Thank you, Heather. And thank you everybody for uh, participating and being involved in the program. And it's really great to, to do this with uh, Tim and Sherry. And uh, we're gonna be talking about a lot of different things here today. Uh, and the intent is to provide some general information, not any specific uh, information with regard to any specific circumstance, but again, just uh, general information as uh, uh, Heather, I think we have that on slide two. And then we go to uh, page three, an overview of what we're gonna talk about, the basic legal documents that everybody should have, and taxes. When we talk about taxes, uh, essentially it's Pennsylvania inheritance tax and federal estate tax, which are taxes due when somebody passes away. We'll also touch on some income tax considerations that people should keep in mind. And then we're gonna talk about distributions of assets not controlled by a person's will. There are a lot of things that do not go in accordance with the person's will, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, we'll touch on uh, leaving a legacy and how a person would be able to do that through their estate plan. So if we start here with the three legal documents that really everybody should have, uh, one is a durable power of attorney that provides authority to handle financial matters. Secondly, a durable healthcare power of attorney and living will, which relates strictly to medical matters. And thirdly, the last will and testament. And maybe perhaps to just define uh, a term here, durable. You often hear that word durable power of attorney and you wonder, what does that mean? It simply means that the power of attorney would be remain effective despite any incapacity or disability. And in reality, that's when we want it to be effective, when somebody would be unable to handle things for, their, for themselves. And then uh, talking about the, the durable power of attorney, it provides for the appointment of an agent to act for you as to financial matters. And perhaps again, to define a few terms, the person who gives the power of attorney is known as the principal. The person who receives the authority is the agent. I have a power of attorney where I name my wife as my agent. I am the principal, she is the agent. In her power of attorney, she is the principal and I am the agent. Very importantly to keep in mind is that uh, power of attorney is effective only during lifetime and automatically revoked by death. And so in many situations, we'll have say a child who is the agent for a parent and the child is paying the parent's bill because bills and handling the finances because the parent is unable to. The parent passes away. That power of attorney is revoked at that point in time. It's then the executor named in the will who has authority to do things, which incidentally, there's often a, a period of limbo, well, always is, when the power of attorney is revoked and then the executor is not appointed by the register of wills until say a week later, and then at that point, the executor has authority. Then we have to keep in mind that if somebody becomes incapacitated and they don't have a durable power of attorney, it could be necessary for a court to appoint a guardian for you. This is really important because powers of attorney have become even more important in recent years. Say if I don't have a power of attorney and I'm incapacitated, I have uh, Alzheimer's or I'm in an accident and I can't handle financial matters. My wife would be able to handle our joint bank account, but what about a, a deed for a real estate or a stock certificate that needs to be signed or anything else that needs to be done, any other financial matter? In the absence of a power of attorney, 
it would be necessary to go into court and have an attorney file a petition with the court and ask that a guardian be appointed for me so that she would be able to do those things. And the, in summary, some of the things to keep in mind is that process is firstly expensive. Secondly, it's time consuming. And thirdly, I think the, the biggest difficulty in going into court and have a, having a guardian appointed is that it's emotionally draining for the family to go through that process. Uh, Heather, how about the next slide? Special powers. If the power of attorney expressly grants the agent authority, there are certain things that can be done. And to make a gift, to transfer assets, say, uh, from one spouse to another, or if the document provides also it could be to children, to create or change rights of survivorship, to create or change a beneficiary designation. And you may wonder, well, why would I want those powers in that power of attorney? Well, oftentimes I find there could be two reasons, two potential reasons. One, say if somebody is subject to federal estate tax or any other or even Pennsylvania inheritance tax. If gifts are made and the size of the estate is reduced, maybe uh, Pennsylvania inheritance tax and federal estate tax can be reduced. A second reason, which very often comes into play, say if a, a, a spouse had to go into a nursing home. Well, the cost is huge to pay for a nursing home. But what if the uh, spouse in the nursing home, the spouse is incapacitated. Maybe there's a benefit to do some what we call Medicaid planning to transfer assets, to change beneficiary designation forms, to provide funding and assets for the spouse living in the residence so that everything doesn't go into the nursing home. But if we don't have the powers in the power of attorney to allow the agent to do those things on behalf of the person in the nursing home, that can be a problem. So these special powers have become exceedingly important and, uh, and often put in the power of attorney. So then we go to the next one, the healthcare power of attorney and living will. And there's no set format for a healthcare power of attorney and living will. The statute has a suggested format. My policy has been to use the, the format in the statute, although that form is probably 10, 12 pages long and I compressed it a little bit, but it's still basically the same. But think of it this way, uh, the way I handle it, and there can be different ways, but I have all the medical matters in this healthcare power of attorney and loving will, and it has two parts the healthcare power of attorney where I name a healthcare agent, and part two is the living will where I say, however, healthcare agent, if I happen to be in an end-stage medical condition or if I'm permanently unconscious, these are my wishes that I wanna have followed, and then you don't need to make those decisions. Example, I have a healthcare power of attorney and living will. Say if I left my office and I'm in an, in an accident, I'm taken to the hospital and I'm unconscious, Somebody has to decide what type of healthcare treatment I would get, what medical facility I would be placed into, what type of medical and surgical procedures would be applied. My wife as my healthcare agent would make those decisions. But say if weeks or months down the line, the doctor says he's now permanently unconscious, no longer temporarily unconscious. That's when the living will kicks in because the living will is a document that part two I made that document, I signed it when I was capable of expressing my wishes. So it accomplishes two things. It assures that my wishes are followed, first of all, and secondly, it relieves my wife from having to make those decisions in the event that I'm in that condition. In other words, in that living will, I say, if I'm permanently unconscious, I don't wanna have extraordinary means used to keep me alive. So that's essentially how that works. Now. Um, the durable health care power of attorney, um, on the next slide, uh, Heather, it provides the agent has authorities, has the authority to make any health care decision that the principal, the person who gave the power, could have made. 
Now, the issue is, what if somebody doesn't have a health care power of attorney? This is where it can be difficult, because then the statute defines who would be what they call the health care representative, really the agent to make those decisions. And it's kind of left to chance. And there's an order of priority in the statute. Where it can really get difficult is, say, if there's two, three, or more children and no spouse. And... Um, and they don't agree. And, you know, I've talked to people at the different hospitals and doctors about this. It really makes a difficult situation because what do they do? One child says, do this surgery. And another child says, no way. And uh, it's far better to have a person named rather than leave it to chance. On the next page, the living will. When does this become operative? Well, you have to be incompetent. And the second requirement is in the alternative. You have to be either in the very end stage of a medical condition, a terminal condition, or in a state of permanent unconsciousness. One of those two conditions you have to be in for this to be operative. Now, oftentimes people say, well, you know, what if I'm, uh, in the example I gave, taken to the hospital I'm, and I'm unconscious. Does that mean I won't get resuscitation and antibiotics and everything else I need? No, I'm gonna get everything I need. It's only if I am permanently unconscious uh, with no chance of coming out of it. So on the next slide, we say, if you would be in one of those two conditions, in other words, in the very end stage of a terminal condition or if you would be permanently unconscious. The living will reflects your wishes as to medical treatment. And secondly, it relieves the family or others from the burden of having to make those decisions. You know, I remember, you know, when I first started practicing, there was no such thing as a living will. Uh, and it just started to appear. And, um, and nowadays, when you think of medical technology and medical procedures and medications, you know, people can be kept alive almost indefinitely. So it's become a really important document. Uh, the will. Uh, your will. Uh, hey, Tom. Tom. Yes, Tim. No, no not awkward way to interrupt you. Um, this is uh, Tim Sutherland here. I wanted to just add a comment, if it's okay, sure. regarding the powers of attorney. Uh, I'll share our personal story. So when we think of healthcare power of attorney, as Tom well said, it's, we think it's sort of the fourth quarter in life. I'll share a personal story I had, why this is important for um, basically all, uh, all periods of life. Our daughter was in college several years ago, and there was a health issue. She was, turns out to be okay, but since she was an adult, and we called the university, they would not speak to us because she was a legal adult, even though we're paying the bill, um, they wouldn't talk to us. So I realized the mistake I had made. I did not have a health care power of attorney place where I was serving as her agent. And as Tom alluded to, without having a document in place, you have adult young children who don't have a spouse. Uh, their need, that document is important at all stages in life. And, you know, think about going and um, having that document drawn up where you can step in if there is a crisis and, and make the kind of decisions um, on behalf of your child. You know, it's a, it's a great point, Tim. You know, uh, my wife and I have, have two children and, uh, and I did healthcare powers of attorney for both of them. You know, when they were off in school, you know, if something had to happen, it's a very good example there, Tim, as to the benefit and value of those documents. Yeah, Tim and Tom, I would agree. Um, and Tom, I guess I would just add for the, the good of the group, um, all the statutes you're talking about are Pennsylvania. So in case anybody in the audience has family members in another state, you know, it may differ there, you know, and I think you would agree with that, Tom, that everything we're talking about today is Pennsylvania statutes, and it may differ if you have other family members that you might be helping with these things. Their statutes might be a little different. Uh, Sherry, it's a, a great point. And uh, when I have clients that they say, you know, I'm moving to Colorado or moving to Maryland, I always tell them, I say, you need to... Uh, uh, have an attorney in that area review the documents and most probably they'll do new documents. I talked to a client just yesterday that moved to Washington and it's exactly 
that reason because all state laws are different and and especially with things like the financial powers of attorney and healthcare powers of attorney. It's it's a great point. Great point. So on the will, uh, you know, you can make provisions with regard to the disposition of your property, create a trust, you know, appoint a guardian for minor children. And this is important for young couples because, you know, if young couples have young children, they want to provide that should want to provide what happens if something happens to both parents and who would have actual physical care of the children. And, uh, and you can also, of course, and need to put in the will, someone to administer your estate, and that would be the executor. And the, uh, the will, as we talked about before, really comes into play when somebody passes away. And the next page, well, one other quick comment with regard to trust. You know, sometimes people uh, wonder about who do I name as trustee? Uh, very often they'll name a, a family member, say a, a sibling or parent or child or other family member or close friend. Uh, and, but sometimes it can be a corporate trustee. And a corporate trustee sometimes is, is beneficial uh, if say there's any conflict and you want somebody totally independent uh, that is going to be able to make the decisions with regard to distributions of say income or principal. Uh, also, they have the expertise in handling uh, funds and money. And thirdly, sometimes an issue is, you know, you know, I have this older person that's going to be my trustee. Well, you name a, a corporate trustee, you're reasonably assured of uh, continued existence and that they'll always be able to serve. So when we look at uh, the will, in the absence of a will, your property would pass very mechanically according to what's called the intestate statute. Think of it this way. If somebody dies with the will, they are said to have died testing with the will. If they die without a will, then their assets pass by the intestacy laws. And every state has their own intestacy laws. And basically it provides very mechanically, you know, a certain amount would go to a spouse and then to a certain amount to children and, and no spouse or children than the parents and, and then to siblings and so on and so on. The point is it's left to chance as to where your assets go. And it's also left to chance as to who would be the one to handle the estate. And incidentally, an executor is somebody named in a will to handle an in the state. An administrator is one where there is no executor named in the will or there is no will. They really serve the same function, but that's how that works. So without a will, you can't make a bequest to charity. Can't, you know, uh, give uh, family heirlooms, can't provide for minors, disabled persons or somebody that has difficulty managing money where maybe it would be beneficial to create a trust. So there is a lot of value and importance, I think, in, in having a will. And then this is really important, what your will does not cover. It does not dispose of any jointly owned property or property that contains a designated beneficiary other than your estate. Many times, say with a husband and wife, you know, they'll have, say, their real estate and bank accounts, and if there are any brokerage accounts, they'll have them joint with their spouse. Well, if one of them passes away, they go to the spouse, if they're joint with right of survivorship. Um, or maybe they also have property that has a designated beneficiary, like a life insurance policy or a retirement fund. And if it names the spouse as beneficiary, it's going to go to the spouse. So very often with husband and wife, uh, we don't even probate the will of the first spouse unless there's some asset in that first spouse's name that is not jointly owned and does not pass by beneficiary designation, say to the spouse. But the same principle can apply to others as well. You know, jointly owned property, say with a, a child or with uh, 
somebody else. Although that raises other questions as to inheritance tax. And maybe I should mention that briefly. Sometimes uh, I find that somebody says, well, I put that bank account in joint names with my child and it's gonna go to the child upon my death. And that's correct. But some of the implications of that would be maybe that distorts the terms of the will where you know the will says everything goes to all the children. And the second implication would be if the joint account was set up, the joint property was set up more than one year before death, only one half would be subject to tax with two joint owners. However, what happens if the child predeceases the parent? Then the parent pays inheritance tax to get their own property back. Every now and then that happens, you know, where a a uh, parent calls in and says, you know, my child passed away unexpectedly and we have this joint asset. Well, unfortunately there's inheritance tax that do. But non-probate assets are really important to think about and to think about the consequences of establishing them. So the basic legal document review, three basic documents. Again, the, the durable power of attorney, which really relates to financial matters. Secondly, the healthcare power of attorney and living will, which provides for medical matters that need to be addressed. And they're both documents that are important during a person's lifetime. And then the third document, the will, which really covers, well, what happens when I pass away? What happens to my assets? And that would be on the will. So, the next slide, we talk about Pennsylvania inheritance tax. Pennsylvania only has a few tax rates. And um, first of all, let me say, how does that work? For Pennsylvania inheritance tax, you value all the assets in a person's estate as of their date of death. You value all them, real estate, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, anything else. And then you're allowed certain deductions, funeral expenses, administration expenses, and debts. The net amount then is subject to Pennsylvania inheritance tax. And the tax rate depends upon the relationship of the beneficiary to the decedent. So anything that goes to a spouse, zero tax. Anything to charity, zero tax. From children 21 and under to parents, zero. And as of within the last year, the statute was changed to provide anything from parents to children 21 and under, zero. So the 4.5% uh, rate applies to anything that would pass to children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or to parents or grandparents. And then anything left to a brother or sister is a 12%. All others are 15%. So that would be nephew, niece, cousin, friend. They're all at 15%. Federal state tax. Big changes have occurred over the years with regard to federal state tax. It wasn't 15, 20 years ago, the federal state tax exemption was just $600,000. Now, in 2020, the exemption is $11.58 million. Uh, and it removes most everybody, almost everybody from federal state tax. Uh, however, after 2025, automatically the law is scheduled to revert to what it was in 2017, which would basically be a $5, $5 million exemption for everybody, I'm sorry. And then the federal state tax exemption is portable, which means, without getting too much into it, it means that upon the death of the first spouse, if they don't use their exemption amount, whatever it is, then it can be, uh, or transferred over to the surviving spouse, provided that a federal estate tax return is filed. Now, the next page talks about federal gift tax uh, matters. Everybody has an exclusion of $15,000 per donee uh, for 2020. So uh, $15,000 can be given to a child, to the child's spouse, to each of the grandchildren without any um, uh, federal gift tax implications. 
And then there could be unlimited gifting for tuition and medical expenses provided certain conditions are fulfilled. And then if somebody goes above that annual exclusion, uh, then it would be necessary to file a federal gift tax return, but the gift tax exemption is tied into the federal estate tax exemption. So it's 11.58 million. Just very briefly, if somebody gave away 11.5 bill, 11.58 million during their lifetime, then they don't have any exemption to use in their estate upon their death. Distributions of assets not covered under your will. Life insurance. Hey uh, Tom. Yes. Sorry, I had one question that was just pertinent, so I thought I'd bring it to your attention now. Yes. Uh, the question goes back to the state taxes. So is the sibling taxes at 12%? if that sibling is also named as the legal, legal guardian of your children or minors. I can say that one more time. I didn't read that very well. So <laughs> is the sibling taxes of 12%, um, is that eligible also if uh, your sibling is named as a legal guardian of your children? Uh, well, the, the guardian would, if, if the gift is to the children, the tax rate is 4.5% not 12%, so it's even better. And if it just so happens that somebody is a guardian for them, uh, it's not their money, it's the, the child's money. So the tax rate would be 4.5% and, and not 12%. All right, thank you. Sure. So planning for assets outside your will. When, when I do an estate plan, and when I say estate plan, by the way, I'm really talking about a will and power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney and living will. I, I devote a lot of attention to what we call the assets, non-probate assets passing outside the will. And most importantly, retirement funds to make sure that the beneficiary designation forms are correctly stated. Because those assets don't go in accordance with your will unless they're paid on the beneficiary designation form to your estate. So it's really, really important to have those correctly stated. And nowadays I find a large portion, oftentimes 50% or more of what somebody has is in retirement funds. So they pass by the beneficiary designation form and not by the will. So life insurance, retirement accounts, jointly owned assets, trusts that have uh, beneficiaries, named beneficiaries, they all go, uh, they're called non-probate assets. So on the next slide, we talk about understanding what your will controls and what it does not. Your will controls any asset that would be titled in your own name alone, not jointly owned, with right of survivorship, and not with the beneficiary designation. And uh, uh, they would pass in accordance with your will. And, um, and your will would be probated. The word probate simply means to prove that it's the original last will and testament. And, and frankly, in Pennsylvania, I think the Pennsylvania statute and case law provides for a very orderly process for the administration of the estate. And uh, I, you know, I don't think it's anything to be fearful of. It's just a very uh, methodical process in handling an estate. Uh, and again, what we say, it's very necessary on the next slide, uh, Heather, to plan for those non-probate non -probate transfers with the same care as you would in writing your will. There, again, the beneficiary designation forms, uh, most importantly, I think, with regard to any retirement funds. So on the next slide, do not direct tax deferred money into the estate or trust unless the amount is small, the income tax result has been analyzed or some overriding reason. What we're really talking about primarily, if we focus on an IRA, you know, if somebody has, uh, you know, $100,000 in an IRA, uh, generally and almost always, but not always, uh, it's not good to have the estate as beneficiary of that IRA. It's better to have a named beneficiary where that named beneficiary can take that money out over a period of time. And um, now, 
on the next one, Heather, uh, fund large charitable bequests with tax deferred money, like an IRA. Charities don't pay income tax. Individuals do. And uh, I, I can't tell you the number of times, you know, when, well, it's almost in every estate plan where a client comes in, you know, and, and you know, I talk to them about the, the size and composition of their estate and how they want their assets to pass. And, and I ask them, I say, you know, are there any charitable organizations that you're interested in, in supporting and care, that you care about? And they say, you know, sometimes they say, no, you know, I just want it all to go to the children. But if they say, or other people, and, and sometimes they say, though, I do want assets to go to uh, a charity. I'd like to have this in their will. And if they have retirement funds, we try to get those gifts made through the retirement funds because the charities don't pay any income tax. We'll look at the example here. And um, so uh, John has a will and he says, I give 100,000 to charity. And oftentimes that's what people say. You know, I want that money to go in my will to charity. And I want the IRA to go to my children. Okay, so what happens? 100,000 cash in the will to charity. Charity doesn't, does not pay any income tax. Charity gets $100,000. But that $100,000 in the IRA, if it goes to children, is gonna be subject to federal income tax, income tax at the child's rate, whatever it may be. And if they're at the 24% bracket, it's gonna be $24,000 of tax. And the children get 76,000. Again, it all is based on what tax bracket the, the children would be at. Right. But if we go to the next slide and we see, if we just very simply reverse it and we say, I'm gonna have that 100,000 of cash go to my children under my will and they're not gonna pay any income tax. And that IRA where I have $100,000, I'm gonna have that go to charity because they don't pay any income tax. So. 100,000 goes to children, 100,000 goes to charity. The only one that loses out is the IRS. They don't get those tax dollars. Tom, were you gonna yeah. mention the, the Secure Act stretch IRA changing? Or uh, really yeah, maybe, uh, and Tim, you can maybe elaborate on this, but basically it's really an important point. Uh, it's good that you brought it up, Tim. January 1st of this year, there was a new statute passed called the SECURE Act. Prior to January 1 of 2020, if you had an individual named as beneficiary of an IRA, they could take that money out over their life expectancy. And oftentimes it would be beneficial to have a young beneficiary, say 25 years old, they could take it out over their life expectancy based on IRS actuarial tables and they could take it out maybe over 60 years with only a minimum required distribution each year. January 1 of this year, the SECURE Act now mandates that the individuals, as a general rule, there are exceptions, must take that money out over a period of 10 years. Tim, what would you like to add to that? Sure, John, thank you, yeah, that's excellent. So the problem is this, um, in the past, we called it a stretch IRA strategy where the IRA, relieving IRAs to children, especially if they're younger, actually was a good income tax planning strategy. That's been thrown out the window this year. So a lot of planners, estate planners, financial planners, what have you, are really having to go back and revisit this, and Tom's alluded to it. The IRA becomes, in a lot of respects, a better, better charitable um, device through your estate because of this cha radical change in the tax code. It's a profound change and a lot of folks are going to have to go back and revisit their estate plan about are they going to leave assets, thinking about income taxes, in their inheritance plan. And Very Tim, when you talk about stretch, I was just going to add, um, when you talk about the stretch, you're really, it was allowing them to stretch over their lifetime the income tax that was due. They were taking a distribution every single year and paying some income tax. So it's not avoiding income tax or it's just the difference between stretching it over their lifetime and having to pay that income tax and take those distributions over the 10 years now. Hey, I just have one question from the audience too. So um, going back to gifts 
to a spouse, is the $15,000 a year gift from the estate only while the person is still alive? Uh, the 15,000 exclusion applies to lifetime gifts. Yes, yes. But again, upon right. death, somebody can leave 11,580,000 uh, uh, in their estate. Can you Next slide the uh, uh, these sent to us so that we can print them? Absolutely. Yep. And the whole presentation will be available on our website too. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Thanks, Al. So, uh, you know what happens? There are situations where, uh, like a a retirement fund that would be payable to a beneficiary under the age of 25. And maybe it would not be necessary to have uh, a trust, the complexity of a trust. There's a thing called the Uniform Transfers to Minors Act, and every state has one of these. And Pennsylvania's Uniform Transfers to Minors Act says that you can set up an account for uh, a beneficiary, and it can be held to the age of 25. And the point is, is that this can be a very good technique to use, a, a simpler technique than a trust for beneficiaries under the age of 25 under the Pennsylvania statute. So the non-probate property recap. Uh, again, it covers uh, non-probate assets or assets uh, transferred outside your will, like jointly owned property beneficiary designated property. Many non-probate non, uh, assets are subject to income tax as well as inheritance tax. Uh, and it's important to understand what your will covers and what it does not cover. You know, sometimes, it, another thing I'll mention, a lot of times I find people are setting up transfer on death accounts or payable on death accounts. And, and, and if, you got to really look at the reason for it because they could distort an estate plan too, you know, because those assets would be passing directly to the name uh, beneficiary. So you have to plan for these non-probate assets just as carefully as you would prepare for your will. So that's it on uh, the primary estate planning documents. Uh, there's a lot of ways to leave a legacy. And Sherry, uh, uh, you wanna talk about that? Sure, gladly. Um, just for the audience, um, to let you know, I'm kind of wearing three different hats here. You know, throughout my career, I've either worked on helping people in a trust department, the individuals do some of these things. Um, I've also worked for a nonprofit. So I've been a gift officer at Lafayette College for several years. And so I've worked for the nonprofit uh, who's looking to raise gifts and, and help donors. Um, and now, now thirdly, I manage the nonprofit services division at Fulton Financial Advisors, Fulton Bank. Um, so all of my clients or all of the accounts that I have in some way have a connection to a nonprofit. So it gives you some idea that I can wear three different hats today and I'm very glad to be here. Um, so leaving a legacy, you know, I think you can look at the two sides of a legacy. You know, every one of these things that we're gonna look at on this slide, you can do it on the personal side, whether it's leaving it to your family, to children, to people but you can also do it on the charitable side and leave a legacy with a nonprofit or some charitable organization that supports something that you feel very, very strongly about. So think about that. Tom already talked, you can give lifetime gifts to individuals that you care about and you wanna do it while you're alive. But you can also do that and hopefully due to the History Center and others like them, um, you can give lifetime gifts to a, a charity. Um, and there's various rules that govern that. I think we're gonna do a future one that talks a little bit more about some of the rules that, that govern your gifts. On um, beneficiary designations, you know, Tom mentioned these throughout that you can do it to an individual where you transfer a bank account or have a, a, an asset that's payable on death to individuals. You can also do the same thing and have it go to a nonprofit or charity. Your will, same thing. You can do those legacies to either side. And then if you were to write your will and then later on say, wow, I forgot this or you start to feel strongly and more passionate about a person or about a, 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 a um, you know, a nonprofit, you can do a codicil. Um, and then the different types of bequests, you know, you can do it at a set dollar amount. 
You can do it as a percentage, which we often see on the beneficiary designation form. And you can even give out a bunch of different gifts and then at the very end say the remainder of the residue. Uh, in my department, we have a lot of trusts that um, folks set up where um, they did all their gifting in their will. They took care of everybody that they wanted to. And then they said, a lot of times it's folks with no children, maybe not with a big extended family. And they look at it and say, wow, what do I want to do the rest of this? So what they do is they set up a charitable trust. They set up a trust. They've named, in our case, Fulton to be the trustee. And they say, we want to support either this charitable organization. We have some that support several charitable organizations. But every single year from that trust, we give a donation from that donor. It's not from Fulton. It's from that donor. We say, this is coming from the you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith you know, trust that was up. And every year, they're remembered by that nonprofit. And it just goes on in perpetuity as long as, as they're around. So there's many, many ways. Um, for you to leave a legacy. And a lot of these things are considered a bequest or talked about at the nonprofit level as a bequest. And a lot of times when you do any one of these things, um, you become a member of a society. So when I was at Lafayette College, we had the uh, Porter Society, which um, acknowledged those folks who did all but the lifetime gift. It pretty much was any of those beneficiary designations, the will. Anytime we found out about a donor who was going to do one of those um, things after the lifetime gift, that was a society they ended up in. So I think Heather's gonna talk about that a little bit at the end, and um, here is the, the Louis Miller Society, but she'll mention that a little bit. Uh, but that's a little bit about leaving a legacy. On the next slide, Heather, gets into some other gifts that you can do. Um, you know, some people, and definitely have had this, ask Tom had an, an example yesterday of, of one of his clients. I know from working at the college, I had some donors say this, you know, gee, I really would like to make a gift I do have 50, 100,000 in my checking account right now. Um, it's not earning much, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, and to answer that question, can I give money to the charity, but somehow get the income for myself? The answer is yes. And you can do it through either a charitable gift annuity or through a charitable remainder trust. Um, you know, in the case of the History Center and a lot of other nonprofits, um, it's a liability to take on a charitable gift annuity. You're gonna pay that donor a certain income for the rest of their lives, so you are taking on a bit of a liability. Um, so sometimes they just don't have the financial wherewithal to do that, but they'll put you in touch with a community foundation that often does have the financial you know, wherewithal to go ahead and do that. They do the actuarial tables and, and things like that. And I looked up, you know, if you just to give you some idea, we do this for several of our nonprofit clients. We help them with their charitable gift annuity program. And I looked up last night just to give you some idea, a 72 year old person, um, actually in this case it was a male because there was a difference on the life expectancy tables of a male and a female, but if you were to turn, go to a charity right now and say, I have $10,000, um, if I gift it to you now, but do what they call a charitable gift annuity, what kind of rate could I get for the rest of my lifetime? And I just looked at one single lifetime. Um, the rate right now would be 4.9%. Um, so, you know, when you compare it to what's going on in the markets right now, where interest rates are, you know, to get 4.9% when you're 72 years old for the rest of your life, it might be something of interest. And I think, you know, not focusing on it as an investment and not focusing on it as the rate, focus on it as, gee, I can make the gift, but I can still even better, better the return that I'm getting elsewhere. So your main reason for doing the charitable gift annuity really should be that you're looking to make that gift and be recognized for it now, rather than waiting and doing it later in your will or in, a, in some other way, you know? So I think that you want that to be mostly because you care about the organization. Charitable trusts get much more, um, they give you a lot more flexibility. You can do more things with them. The charitable gift annuity is pretty set. It's for your lifetime. There's a few little nuances to it, um, but the charitable remainder trust is if you wanna do some other things, benefit several organizations, have something happen where eventually it also benefits your children, then you have to get into a, a trust situation um, with the charitable trust. And then the last one are some of the assets. Um, I shouldn't say the last one, I think it's the next to last one, um, are some of the special assets that are better. So Tom already covered, you know, the IRA, um, you know, the, the benefits of doing that so that your, your children or your beneficiaries won't pay tax. So if you had the ability on the IRA savings bonds, you know, there are a lot of people that over the years bought savings bonds. They're sitting on a lot of interest that has never been reported or taxed. Another great thing, deferred annuities. Um, the life insurance, life insurance is one that we often see people do. And again, there are some great planning nuances there that I know Tim and, and Tom could definitely help you with on the life insurance. And then one that we see on a very regular basis 
and is appreciated property. So a lot of folks are holding some stocks or mutual funds, especially stock mutual funds, maybe real estate. Um, but on a very regular basis, we see the, the stocks being gifted to a nonprofit so that you can avoid any capital gains tax on it. The nonprofit doesn't have to pay the capital gains. So it's a great way to transfer some property and make a gift and not take it from your, your checking account. You need to do, do it from some stock. So contact your nonprofit. Almost all of them are willing to figure it out and, and find a way to do the appreciated property. And I'd say in our department, we have at least a gift every single day for one of our clients that comes in from a donor um, who realizes the benefits of, of passing along that capital gains tax and not having been paid by the, by the nonprofit. And then the last page before we uh, um, get into the, the final two things, um, you know, how can you leave a legacy? Um, we already started talking about it. You know, it is the talking. It's the um, going to the staff of the charity, uh, talk about, you know, their needs, how you can help, but also talk about what you're trying to do. You know, I think I find that so many donors um, maybe aren't as willing to be open and, and talk to the nonprofit. Um, I, they'll work with you. You know, I, I don't think they care what size gift you're talking about. Um, they will help you figure out. I think so many people are afraid, well, I don't have enough, and, and that gift officer is going to want me to give more. Um, I would say in my career, and I think Heather would back me up, you know, we will talk to every donor that we can and help you in any way we can without pressure um, to do more. You know, it really is about what the donor wants to do, um, and you'd be surprised at, you know, what the gift officer knows and can put you in touch with somebody like a Tom and somebody like a Tim, um, which is the acting. You know, eventually you have to get to those folks and that team that can help you put it in place. Um, but I would say everybody on this call today is, is part of that team, and I would hope that anybody is, is comfortable um, talking with any of any of those folks. Um, the one thing we missed, I realize um, there's a popular vehicle. I think I missed it on page 27. We didn't have it on the, the bullet points, um, but donor advice funds. I think we were remiss in not putting it on the slide, um, but there are a lot of folks out there that have some money in donor advised funds. Again, you can do those through the community foundation. Sometimes you can do them right through the nonprofit, and then you can do them through the big mutual fund companies and the big um, investment advisors where you can put the, the gift in there now. You can get credit for it from a tax perspective and just from a, knowing it's there and it's for charitable purposes but usually it's sitting there waiting to figure out which charity it's ultimately going to benefit. So a lot of folks are using donor advised funds and um, I would just encourage you if you are using them, you know, make those gifts now. Some people do it to stay anonymous because you can give it without your name being um, exposed. Um, but I would say get the credit for making the gift and um, you know, do it right away. You know, the nonprofits could certainly use the help right now. So, you know, do it right away. But the donor advice fund is another great way for people to put money aside um, and maybe not have to give it out right away. They can, can wait a little bit. So I think at that point, um, you know, I, I, Heather, I don't know if you want to speak about the endowing your annual gift, but um, I know that's an, an option as well where you can work with the charity and have your annual gift that you give every year, you know, put into an endowment that can do a lot like the trust I were talking about. And I, I do believe that's something the History Center has as well as a lot of other nonprofits have. Maybe just a, a few quick points. One about endowing an annual gift. I often have uh, clients that come in and, you know, they say, well, I have given, you know, $100 or $200 or $500, you know, to this organization every year for the last, you know, 25, 30 years. And, uh, you know, one of the things they can do is, well, what happens when that person passes away? You know, that stream of uh, contributions stops. What they can do is endow their annual gift, which means put a certain amount of money away and it could pay that same amount in perpetuity. So it's, it can be a good uh, idea for some people. Two other quick things I wanted to mention. One with regard to, uh, retirement funds, IRA specifically. You know, something that I find clients are increasingly doing, if they're over 70 and a half, during their lifetime, they can make a gift from their IRA directly to the charity. And the requirements are relatively straightforward. The basic ones are the person has to be over 70 and a half. And secondly, it has to be a transfer directly from the uh, the fund, whatever wherever it is, over to the charity, uh, but it can really be beneficial from several standpoints. And the the donor advised fund, uh, it's great that you mentioned that, Sherry. And 
you know, with the tax law that was passed a few years ago, a lot of people aren't itemizing deductions anymore. But now they can more or less bunch those deductions into a gift through a donor advised fund and, and have, in addition to other advantages, a tax advantage. So, you know, if somebody wanted to make a gift to the History Center, or United Way, or wherever, um, they're good options uh, through a donor advised fund or through uh, a lifetime gift provided certain uh, uh, requirements are met with regard to an IRA. So. One thing, I, if I jump here, I'd like to add one last thing. I, I'd like to make a plug for uh, estate planning attorneys like Tom. He, he wouldn't do this. I'm going to do it for him. Um, a lot of times in an estate settlement situation, you know, uh, your instincts sort of say, maybe here's a chance for me to do it myself, the DIY approach, maybe try to save a dollar. I'd certainly encourage you not to do that. We have a client situation right now where, in fact, uh, the situation is really tragic because this individual lost her husband, went to an attorney who was not a special, who did not specialize in estate planning, and they screwed it up. And now she's being sued by her children, her stepchildren. It was a second marriage. But she, this lady did the right thing, but she didn't go to an attorney to a, uh, um, get legal counsel that was expert in estate settlement. So not a place to DIY. I really encourage you to seek out estate planning legal professionals like Tom, because this is, can be, uh, it can be, there's some landmines that you can easily step in. They could be avoidable. Thank you. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing the screen and then I'll stop the recording and we can open up for Q&A. So I will let you know.